All right, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, hello. That is not me on the screen, unless <laughs> Kate wants to move her mouth and it will be me for a, a little bit. <laughs> but uh, hey, everybody, Ryan Leary here from Recruiting Daily. Uh, thank you so much for jumping on the webinar today. We've got a really cool webinar, uh, very good content. And of course, uh, one of the better presenters on the topic, Kate Bischoff. If you don't know Kate, she is a scary employment attorney. He is the yeah. one that uh, that pretty much just takes you to court for whatever she wants, right? Is that, that <laughs> <okay>? <laughs> No, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. It's the opposite, right? So, so we have Kate on the call today. She'll do an intro of herself. She does a really good job, but she uh, has her own uh, consultancy, Thrive, uh, Thrive Law and Consulting. Did I say that right? I yes. got it right? Yeah, good, good, good. So, uh, Kate, welcome into the call. We want to do a quick little intro. Actually, no, before we do the intro of your stuff, let me go through some housekeeping items. Um, so, everybody on the call, we cannot hear you. You, of course, can hear us. Uh, we do have uh, everybody on mute uh, so that everybody can talk over each other. Uh, however, this is an open forum. Kate does have a presentation, but you can ask questions. You can do that on your panel. Uh, to the right hand side, just hit the questions box and you'll be able to answer or ask any questions that you have. We will ask all relevant questions as the presentation is going on, but if it's maybe we'll pass that time, we'll get to it at the end for sure. Uh, yes, we are recording this session and yes, you will have the slide deck and I did see it and there's a ton of information on this one. So you will get some really good and strong resources and at the end we can make some intros to Kate. If you guys need it or want it and have some questions, uh, this is her, her line of business. So, Kate, welcome into the call. We'll just do the intro and uh, let you kick off. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for attending today. We are going to talk about marijuana, everybody's favorite stinky weed, and what the impact of marijuana and the changing laws in this particular area will have on your workplace. So first, a little bit about me. I do suffer from law degree. Please don't hold that against me. I got my HR street cred working for the US Department of State where I was stationed at the Consulate General in Jerusalem and then the US Embassy in Zambia. I've got all the fancy letters and about two and a half years ago, I started my own business doing a lot of this kind of work. I spend a great deal of time talking to my clients about policies and, oh, hey, Kate, can I fire this guy kind of things, but also what the impact of general society is having on our workplaces and how do we navigate the difficulties of those today. I teach HR compliance at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. So we teach to HR folks from around the country and around the world about what compliance means and how we can be effective HR people even when the, our C-suite hates the C word of compliance. I also believe strongly that compliance doesn't mean that we always say no, that we can be very creative in how we go about making sure we're being compliant with the law, but also meeting the business objectives of the business. One other not so secret secret about me is that I love Twitter. And so if you have any questions that you want to check up with me later or you think I say something remarkably brilliant today, feel free to tweet at me and I warm the cockles of my heart every time I get a notification. So please do so. So we're going to talk about the current status of marijuana in the workplace. We'll talk about the new laws. We There are only 15 states now that prohibit marijuana entirely. So this is a growing trend. The Pew Research Center did a study and found that 62% of Americans believe that marijuana should be legalized. And so this is something that's coming at us quickly in the employment setting. And we're gonna talk about the impacts and the decisions that we make surrounding marijuana. And then I wanna give you some tips on how to handle some issues that may come up for your workplace. So is there an impact of marijuana in our workplace? Surprise, surprise, marijuana has been in our workplace for decades. Um, if you think of the stoner eras of the 60s and 70s, we had marijuana in our workplace now. I can guarantee you that you've had an employee smoke marijuana or imbibe it in some way or shape or form on off-duty hours, and that may have already affected your workplace even though it was unlawful at the time. And so marijuana now, even though it has this huge focus on what it's going to mean for our workplace, it is in our workplace, it has been in our workplace, and 
just how we deal with it may be a little bit different. So the first poll is how concerned are you about marijuana in your workplace? So Kate, we have the poll up on the screen. Uh, yeah. Everyone on the call, you go ahead, just click one, make, please. Make a selection there. How concerned are you about marijuana in, in your workplace? Go ahead, we'll give it another maybe half a minute or so. <laughs> Um, and then Kate, we'll drop this back to you. You may have to reshare your screen, so just um, awesome. be on the lookout for that. Let's see, we still got people answering it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, looks like I'm gonna close it up. We looks like we got them. And then let me share the results for you. Awesome, oh, I am so excited that 15% of you think Willie Nelson and Snoop Dogg would be great culture fits. <laughs> um, that is a joke, but I understand where you're coming from. Um, somewhat concerned about it. I think this is pretty accurate. I, I, based on my conversations with clients, I think that's really is kind of where we are, um, is that we are somewhat concerned about it. The, that unease gets bigger and bigger as marijuana becomes more and more lawful in the states that we're in. So if we're concerned about it, what does that mean for us going forward? This is the current map. It's by a drug testing company, but I liked that it was all green. So I'm going to steal it from them. Here is the current status of the law. In the dark green, we've got the states that have it completely legalized, both uh, recreational, medicinal. Then we have some medical decriminalized and the met, just the medical only. And then we have the fully unlawful. And there's those 15 states that have it still completely unlawful. And this makes for employers who have employees in multiple different states, it, it's a difficult tack to take. Like, how are we going to handle, if we're based in Idaho, how are we going to handle our employees who work in Washington or California? And so do we have to adjust how we think about marijuana and how that is going to affect behavior overall? And sometimes the answer is no. If it's going to affect behavior, we should have our same behavior expectations. And in other situations, you know, if they're testing positive for it, well, what are we going to do in those situations? And I'll cover a little bit in this webinar on that particular topic. Hey, can we, so, we have a question? We got a question on that slide. Sure. If you jump back yeah. to the slide. The, they're asking about the key there at the bottom. Can you explain what each of those keys mean? And I, and I the, the direct sure. question, what is the difference between fully legal versus legalized? So the fully legal means that it is a readily available to adults. Usually it's over the age of 18 or, or 21. I'm not into the minutia of the actual age because I live in a dark green state um, and not a super dark green state. Um, but if you're legalized, it's available recreational, which means that you can go to a dispensary, like a store, and it, it is a very interesting place because you show your ID probably in multiple different locations at the when you enter the store and then again at purchase. Uh, you talk to somebody and they will give you the form of marijuana that you're looking for, and then you can walk out and it's a, you can do it in your home, in your abode, probably not in public places, but you are able to imbibe marijuana wherever you want to, essentially. Um, for the medical, it is only available for a prescription basis for some, and in some states, only specific purposes. So for example, in the great state of Minnesota, there are a list of conditions, medical conditions that you have to have that would are a precursor to getting that prescription. So you can't walk in and say, oh, I have a back strain. Can I please get some marijuana? The doctor's not going to say, well, that I can't give it to you for that. So there are varying different regulations for how states are handling medical marijuana, and it may be very different in each state. So you have to look at that particularly carefully. Um, for the decriminalized, it may be decriminalized in fact that it may be, be able to be uh, cultivated for those med medicinal purposes, and then the fully illegal, you can't grow it, you can't buy it, you can't have it. Those are the kind of the bases there. Okay, so let's talk about the federal government. The federal government does not like marijuana. Um, under former Attorney General Jeff Sessions, he was perhaps one of the most 
anti-marijuana guys out there. It, marijuana has been scheduled. Is a Schedule One narcotic. It, you cannot have it. If you are a federal contractor, which makes up about 25% of employers, and you have a a thousand a hundred thousand dollar contract or contract for services you are required to have a drug-free workplace and that drug-free workplace act in some situations for employers they have decided that if we are going to be a drug-free workplace we have to do drug testing to make sure of that but the actual drug free workplace act does not actually require testing and we learned this in September with the Nofsinger versus SSC Niantic operating company case out of Connecticut. Connecticut is a state where they have a law that says if you are prescribed marijuana, you cannot be discriminated against in hiring, firing, or otherwise treated differently. So this law called PUMA, it's the Palliative Something Medical Marijuana Act, it allows employees to be able to use their medical prescription for marijuana and not suffer adverse employment actions because of it. This law um, prohibits the not hiring. And in this particular case, this is a hiring case. It, a nursing home was looking for a new activities director. This woman applied. She was told she needed to give a, a urine drug test. She said, you know, I have a medical marijuana prescription that I use in the evenings. The test came back positive. She was not hired for that position and she sued. The federal district court, I want to make that, that's an important distinction because it's a federal district court here. It's not a state court because the state court, it may not have necessarily the same kind of precedential weight, but here it, the Connecticut law was used in a federal court and the federal court here said that the employer was discriminating against her based upon this positive medical marijuana test. And so that, you know, she won at summary judgment. This didn't even get to trial. She won off of that case in particular. So it was very, this is a very interesting case. And for federal contractors, this is something you have to keep an eye out for. If you are a federal contractor in a state that allows medical marijuana, you may be in a situation where you're going to be have to decide what you're going to do about this particular case. And there may be a wide range of different options you go with, including things like prohibiting the use of it prior to coming into work, making sure that it is only used after work in the evenings, or that they're not coming in under the influence of the marijuana. There's lots of different things you can do. But as a federal contractor, sometimes the default is, well, we'll just follow federal law and we'll prohibit it. This particular case suggests that for states that have allowed medical marijuana, their employees may have protection. So you have to look at your actual state law and see if this particular provision prohibiting the discrimination for mar medical marijuana is in there, okay? We, we're gonna talk about the Colorado case in a minute because I'm sure some of you are like, but what about that Colorado case? We'll talk about that one as well. But for your federal contractors, please be aware of that. On the flip side, if you have commercial drivers, if you have CDL people and you're under DOT regulations, nothing has changed for you. Even in completely legalized states like California, Colorado, um, you can still prohibit marijuana in all of its uses, provided that you're doing it only for your DOT CDL drivers. Um, that testing has not changed. There was guidance given from the Department of Justice that suggested to federal prosecutors that they may not want to prosecute medical marijuana cases, but that has had no effect on DOT. DOT has specifically said, if you have drivers who are using medical marijuana, our regulations are still gonna require, you cannot have those people driving. So just be aware of that. I know that doesn't apply to all of you, but it does really make a big difference. So let's get into the illegal states. So if you're in the 15 states where it's completely illegal, you can prohibit this for everyone. It is A-OK -okay to do that. Testing absent specific state laws about how you treat drug, drug testing, you can even test for it. And absent some kind of collective bargaining agreement or good cause termination requirements that may be in employment contracts, you would be able to not hire or terminate an individual who tested positive for marijuana. 
Okay, so illegal states is still relatively easy. For medical marijuana states, it gets a little bit more difficult because marijuana is permitted to be used only with a prescription by a medical professional. And sometimes this is limited both in what kinds of conditions can get the medical marijuana, others it's limited to how the marijuana can actually be consumed. You're, this is not going to be, hey, roll up to the pharmacy, get six joints. It may be in, in pill form. It may be in a vaporized form. It may be in oil form. It may be in something that's edible as well. So each state has different regulations on how you can imbibe the marijuana. In fact, I, since I'm giving this presentation, I did a lot of research about marijuana, and there was a letter to the editor in my local newspaper, the Star Tribune, that asked that we legalize marijuana, but we only legalize it in edible form, which I thought was interesting, cute, okay? If you are in a medical marijuana state, there is this tension between your obligations to reasonably accommodate individuals and have that drug-free workplace situation. And if you are going to reasonably accommodate an individual who is, has a medical marijuana uh, prescription, what does that look like for your drug-free workplace? Does that mean you set time limits on when someone can imbibe the marijuana? Does that mean that they cannot have it in the workplace? There are going to be some things that you're going to be able, limitations on it that you might be able to apply. But if you have an individual with a health condition that requires this medical marijuana per a healthcare provider, then what kind of reasonable accommodations are we going to provide? Now, this may not necessarily be an Americans with Disability Act analysis, but it may be an analysis for your individual state that mirrors that. That Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay, so let's talk about the Colorado case because the Colorado case has gotten a ton of press. It's kind of old now, I think it's from 2015, um, but it does give us a good test case scenario about the risks associated with medical marijuana for your workplace. So Dish Network had a no tolerance on drug no tolerance on drugs. They did random drug testing. They had one employee who worked in the call center. His name was Mr. Coates. He was a quadriplegic. He took marijuana for pain and he took it only after work and on weekends. Dish had a, this robust drug testing policy. He tested positive and then was fired because he had that positive test. He sued and the case went all the way to the Colorado Supreme Court, which is kind of remarkable. If you have ever been in litigation, that takes a long time and a lot of persistence to get all the way to a Supreme Court in a, in a state. So what the Supreme Court of Colorado said was that the employer could prohibit marijuana use because the marijuana was not lawful under federal law, so DISH could terminate Mr. Coates for it. And that was the analysis. Um, Mr. Coates had argued for the reasonable accommodation piece and that the marijuana was lawful under state law, but the Colorado Supreme Court rested on this idea that because it was unlawful under federal law, the employer could then make the decision. So this poses a kind of conundrum. If you're an employer who's going to rest all of your decision making on this Coats versus Dish Network case, that you have a zero tolerance for it because it's unlawful, unlawful under federal law, well, the Connecticut case, Connecticut case we talked about earlier kind of runs counterintuitive to that because even though the nursing home in Knoxinger said, hey, it's unlawful under federal law, the courts still say, but your state law says you can't discriminate based on this. And so we're kind of in this uh, time where we don't know exactly, but I'll, I'll walk you through some scenarios about how we, how I would necessarily talk to my clients about handling these situations. Okay, okay so, so before, before yeah. you on there, Kate, we do have a question that came in and forgive me because I'm not familiar with all of this. But okay. the question says, what about PHMSA? I don't know what that is. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. If you can give me more information, I will try yeah. to help on okay. that. But I, I don't know what that is. Okay. Okay. So prepare yourself for bad marijuana puns. Okay. So in the token states that have legalized marijuana, adults can obtain marijuana 
for medical or recreational use. These an incredible edible amount of ways to imbibe marijuana. It is in drinks, it's in food, it's in, you can smoke it, you can vape it, you can, there are even cannabis oils that you can have a massage done with it. I'm learning so much. But to be blunt, marijuana is really available. It's widely available. It can be obtained even in states where they've lagged a little bit behind on the regulations that would allow it. For example, in Massachusetts, we're going to see marijuana be available almost as readily as alcohol. And that's kind of the tack most of these regulations have taken is that marijuana, we've legalized it, it's going to be, we're going to treat it similar to alcohol. Okay, so now you have a workplace that you're supposed to be drug free or that you've decided that you're going to be drug free and marijuana is now readily available. What do you do in this situation? So it's going to be tricky, but here's some things that I want you to think about. First, what kind of state are you in? Are you in a medical marijuana state, an unlawful state or a recreational state? What is your goal with your policy? If your goal is to keep everyone safe because they're all in safety sensitive positions, well, that's one thing. If your goal is to provide a happy, healthy workplace, maybe your rules look different than the safety sensitive, we have to do it this way. And then what is your philosophy about this? I have several clients who I would consider more conservative, um, more hierarchical that would say, we are just not gonna tolerate. Marijuana is bad, we're not gonna tolerate it at all. And so these kinds of concerns are things that you should think about going into how you're gonna handle marijuana in the workplace. For those individuals who are really strict about this, they're gonna say no marijuana at any time. For those who are kind of considering well, what, is this going to have effect on our recruiting? Maybe. So are we going to be more flexible on it? And so I'll go through some things to think about as you're trying to develop what your philosophy as an HR person is going to be towards the drug. So first, I want you to think about what type of employees do you have? What are you what industry are you in? Being in restaurants and hospitalities is going to be very different than manufacturing and highway heavy road construction. So looking at the types of employees you have, do you have safety sensitive positions? Now, be careful here with the safety sensitive positions. If you are someone who has a large machine shop where there is lots of heavy equipment, that is going to be safety sensitive positions. But do you have a receptionist for your machine shop? Well, she's not necessarily going to be in a safety sensitive position. Next is, do you see your employees? I've got clients who have employees across the country going into businesses and residences. If you don't see them, are you going to be more concerned about the effect of marijuana it may have when they're out in front of the community? Maybe. And then do you want a testing policy and procedure? Uh, drug testing is not cheap. It is difficult to administer. It is hard to actually make right under certain state laws. So if you have anybody in the great state of Minnesota, it is really hard to have drug testing here. So we have to think about if you actually want this or you are going to be able to have a drug free workplace and do your good faith efforts, which is the requirement under the law to say we don't tolerate the drugs in the workplace, but we're not going to test for it. The good faith efforts don't necessarily always equal that testing piece. So for industry considerations. Yeah, hey, so we, we got a couple of questions that came in. I want to kind of drop here. Uh, the yeah. PH MSA is the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. Yes. So okay. We're just kind of touching drug. that there. Yep. Yes. Uh, and it says regulates drug testing for employees in oil fields, et cetera, and is different from dot testing. So that's what that was. Yeah. Uh, another question that came in uh, was: Are there any implications against employees who use CBD oil, even possibly at the office, because it is a legal form? Okay, so let's start with the oil industry. The oil industry is very similar to DOT. Keep doing what you're doing in that situation because the the gas and oil industry has significantly heavier regulations on this, similar to DOT. So keep going with that. That just because it's been lawfulized in your state 
don't change how you're doing because I'm sure that regulate regulatory body is going to have a say in that. So consider yourself like DO or consider yourself DOT like in that situation. Um, for the oil, uh, if it is a lawful way to consume it, so if it's a lawful way to have it under a medical marijuana state, then you have to consider whether or not you want it in your workplace. Under the Coast decision, you're still able to say what happens in your workplace, and it's going to depend on the actual medical condition. So if I vape some oil because I'm having a panic attack, and I have panic attacks at work, well, then should I uh, should we allow you to have it at work? Those are going to be some things that you're going to have to consider if okay. you want to take the tact that this is a reasonable accommodation. Okay, and, and this may be one actually for this the stuff you're getting ready to talk about now, so I'll, I'll ask it. And if okay. you're talking about it, then answer it as you get there. Uh, but this is from someone who works in law enforcement. Ah. We do random drug testing every month, also in DC. What what if it pops up on one of our random tests? How would you approach that? I'm, I'll get to that a little bit. Um, if it pops up on one of your random tests in a, where it is lawful, the actual testing is flawed um, because marijuana is stored in the fat in your body. It will show up between 25 and 35 days after you've imbibed it. And so if it tests up positive in the random, we're gonna have to have a conversation with the employee about, okay, marijuana showed up in your system. L let me ask you some questions about it because you're gonna want more information. If particularly where it is lawful, and even though you might still be required to test for it, uh, you are going to have to have some dialogue with the employee about it. And that dialogue may be what actually spurs the decision to fire or to retain. So, okay, so back to some industry considerations. We talked a little bit about drivers. We, we talked a little bit about the safety sensitive positions where your work is dangerous, where you might not see your employees or where you might have contracts that require you to do drug testing, particularly for the construction industry, you may have a general contractor who puts that in as part of their contracts, which says, if you're gonna be working on this new apartment building, you need to make sure that your employees are being tested for drugs and alcohol, and we're gonna prohibit marijuana. You're still gonna be free to do that in even some of the lawful states. The question will become is if the medical marijuana, if it's medical marijuana, and then we have a disease or a medical condition that triggers that. So it's going to be that that tension there in only the situations where it is a prescription. Okay. And where being stoned could impact the safety of employees or others are going to be things that you're going to want to think about in whether you decide what you're or what you're going to do in situations where somebody comes to work high. Okay, so next poll is do you test? And Ryan is going to pull up the poll here. There we go. Poll is live. Do you test? We'll take a moment and answer those questions and then we'll we'll see here when it stops and then we'll we'll drop it down. So got people answering. Yay. I'm I'm really interested in how many people are doing drug testing. I mean the drug testing industry itself is huge. Um, I have never been to an HR conference where drug testing hasn't been like seven uh, actual exhibitors. So oh fascinating. Look at that. Okay, so some of you are testing only for some positions. I, that generally is the position that I take and that I recommend to my clients is we need to be careful about who we're going to be testing. If you're testing for everyone, I look back at the green factors, which we use in background checks. So for example, do you need to be testing your janitor? Do you need do you need to do a background check on your janitor if you're in an office building setting? Do you need to be testing your receptionist? Do you need to be testing um, the person who runs errands for you? Those those are the kinds of considerations. But this is fascinating. Great. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about testing now that we have those poll results. 
And I want to ask you a little bit about testing itself. Testing marijuana is really, really tricky. Because it is stored in the fat, it stays in human systems for a very long time. And the tests, while there's been attempts to make it much more accurate, we can't tell if somebody's under the influence at this particular time. There is no breathalyzer for marijuana. If there was breathalyzer for marijuana, talking about drug testing for marijuana would be very different because we would feel much better about testing people because we would have proof at this point in time that someone is under the influence. But because marijuana stays in our system for so long, we don't really know when the person was actually under the influence. If you're going to be testing, you're going to have to have drug testing policies, and these need to be state specific. Each state has different laws about drug testing, they're, and they're very detailed. Uh, and pro tip, you cannot rely on your vendor to do this for you. If you go up to a vendor and say, hey, I need a drug testing policy and I need you to do the drug testing, they're going to have some templates for you, but you're going to have to make sure that the templates are actually in compliance with your particular state law. Then in that policy, you're going to explain the circumstances giving rise to testing. Is it going to be pre-employment testing? Is it going to be reasonable suspicion testing? Or do you have a random component to it? Um, one client in the aerospace industry is going to have random testing. And they in their policy, they have to explain. We do random testing. Uh, we don't. You, you may not see your name for a long time, but all of a sudden, you might pop up in that situation as well. Okay. So should you test for marijuana? Given the nature of THC that it stays in your system for a long time, maybe testing for marijuana isn't what you want to do. There is a growing public acceptance of marijuana, that's 62% from the Pew study. And then there are significant public health considerations. For example, in states that have legalized marijuana, they see a significant decrease in opioid uh, addictions and overdoses. And so there's a growing argument for legalizing marijuana to reduce opioid addictions. Testing for marijuana could really affect your recruiting because you have to tell applicants that we drug test. Are you going to lose applicants for testing? It could also affect your retention of employees. Does this mean that employees are going to leave you, that you're going to have trouble keeping them? And then there are other options that you could have to test, but it all goes back to that philosophy that you have and that goal that your business has. Do you, What are those considerations to deciding whether or not you want to have marijuana in your workplace or at least tolerate it? Now, again, I'm not arguing for people to be token up at the cube. What I'm saying is, are you going to uh, make it okay for employees to have marijuana off work during off work time? That's the consideration that's going to be tricky. As marijuana be becomes increasingly available, it's going to be increasingly consumed. And so even the individuals who you would have no idea could do it, probably would. So it, it is a chance that they could. So if you're going to test for marijuana, you might even find some of your star employees being the ones that show up positive. So keep these kinds of things in mind when you're developing or figuring out what your approach is going to be. So who should we test? We should be very deliberate in who we test. If we have an entire across the board safety sensitive positions, we should probably test everyone. If we're sending a bunches of people into customer homes, maybe we test all of those individuals, but we don't test the mechanic that works on their truck. So we have to be deliberate in deciding who we do the testing for. Similar to background checks, as I mentioned before, we be selective in who we decide we're going to test. Because we also know that testing for marijuana has a disparate impact on minorities in particular. So we want to be careful that we're not creating a policy that does have that discriminatory result at the end. Think about only those who need it for both applicants and employees. If you're doing across the board testing, I, if we're asked by a court, I want to be able to tell them why we decided to do everyone and have that justification for every single position as to why we did the test. Never select 
a test based upon the identity of a particular individual. If you have a surfer like dude come in with his carefree uh, hair down, a headband, he looks like the classic hippie, you don't all of a sudden decide that that's the person you're going to be testing because that might not necessarily be the reasonable suspicion that you need um, because you're making based on a stereotype. We're going to be looking for the kinds of reasonable suspicion evidence that this particular individual it could be stoned, not just upon their persona. So if the big Lebowski comes into your office, uh, you're still going to want reasonable suspicion factors, including the smell and paraphernalia and bloodshot eyes. Okay, so don't pick it up based on someone's personality, but you're going to need to have actual evidence that this person might be high if you have reasonable suspicion testing. Okay, so you're gonna decide that you're gonna test and you got somebody tested and they tested positive for THC. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to talk to the employee or the applicant about the test. Um, you can't get the test results in and then make the automatic decision that, hey, you're out. You're gonna to have to ask the employee about this, even in states where it's unlawful. For example, if you live in Texas and someone goes to California for uh, an event, a birthday party for a friend, and they come back to the workplace and you test them, well, what if they were imbibing marijuana in California where it was lawful? And there happened to be one of your star employees. What are you going to do in that situation? Because you couldn't tell based on the test that they were high at this moment in time. So. If the answer, if it relates to a medical condition, does your answer going to change here? If it is a medical condition, I take it for my PTSD, well, you're going to have to figure, go through some analysis of, oh, that's a medical condition, and you're in a medical state, does this mean we change how we do the analysis? What if the answer relates to a trip where it was lawful? As I suggested, does that change our analysis? Because the test isn't telling us this second, we have to think about these kinds of considerations before we take action. So I've got a scenario for you. Jimmy is an applicant for a forklift driver in our warehouse. He has three years experience as a veteran, interviewed really, really well, even offering some suggestions about improving how we do things. He passes the background check, but tests positive for THC. When we ask him about it, he tells us he has PTSD and has a prescription and we're in a medical marijuana state. So if we look at the positives here, Jimmy is a veteran. We're We've launched a hiring veterans campaign. He sounds really good. He knows what he's going to be doing, he, but he's in a safety sensitive position. So how are we going to balance this? And we might have to go back to Jimmy and say, Jimmy, we really do want to hire you, but we're going to put limits on when you can smoke your marijuana or take your marijuana for your PTSD. We might have to come up with some creative ways to handle this situation because we want Jimmy to work for us because we think he's going to be great, but we have this positive marijuana test. And this really gets to back to that goal and philosophy that we have thought about when we were approaching marijuana outside of the particular Jimmy situation. Every employer should take a step back and try to figure out, well, what is our philosophy going to be? Because when we're faced with a particular Jimmy situation, we might say, oh, yeah, it's fine. He's going to be great. We think he's awesome. Uh, he helps with our, our statistics. It's the right thing to do to get the veteran back working. This would be great. But what if the next applicant is... Joe, who is not a veteran, he has the medical prescription for MS and it's he's not in a safety sensitive position. Well, what are we going to do in that situation? So going back to how we're going to approach it from the very beginning is going to give us guidance on what we should do going forward. So be very mindful of that as you start planning how you're going to approach it. Getting into a particular situation like this does kind of set a precedent about how we're going to treat things. And if we do this with Jimmy, what is the next person going to look like?
So another scenario for you, Maria. Maria works in an office for federal contractors with random drug testing. She tests positive for THC. When we ask her about it, she explains that she went to Las Vegas for her best friend's bachelorette party where she did not smoke any joints because she really, really loves this job, but she was in a room that was heavy with smoke from marijuana. So what are we going to do in this situation? We, she works for a federal contractor, which means we have to have a drug-free workplace and we have to have good faith efforts to reach that drug-free workplace. She fell fine under our random testing, but she has an explanation for why she may have tested positive for it. And she admits that she did it in a state where it was lawful. So how are we going to balance those situations? If you called me and we walked through this situation, I may have more questions for you about how can she prove that she was in Las Vegas um, and she might be able to pull up her Facebook and say, he, see, here's a picture. Um, so can she prove that? What do we know about um, her truthiness? Is she, does she tell us the truth? Um, has she shown that she really is committed to this job? Um, we're going to have to go through those kind of touchy situations. The marijuana is not going to provide us a black and white situation. All of these are going to be very complicated for employers to go through. So again, going back to that philosophy and goal is going to be important. So let's talk a little bit about reasonable suspicion. Um, this is when I do reasonable suspicion testing. I go through what are things that would suggest that somebody would be under the influence for that would justify a test for marijuana and in that panel of testing. So if we see things like plastic baggies, rolling papers, other drug paraphernalia, the traditional physical signs, particularly of smoked marijuana would be the very bloodshot eyes. You might smell the marijuana on them. You might have slowed speech and impaired coordination. I mean, if you watch Harold and Kumar or you watched uh, Bill and Ted, you can you have seen some of the acted uh, signs of marijuana use. And then there's the behavioral symptoms of an inability to concentrate, being disoriented, some panicked reactions, and careless attitude. Those are the kind, some of the factors that might show that somebody could be under the influence of marijuana. And here's the thing. These would all be factors of unprofessional and misbehavior in the workplace as well. So if the signs of being high are also signs of being very unprofessional and not being able to complete the work, then as an alternative to the test, maybe we take action based upon the unprofessional behavior. In Minnesota, where we have a very stringent drug testing rule that if you test positive, we have to offer you rehab before we can terminate you. Um, this may be cleaner for some disciplinary actions. If you come high to work, we might say, oh, you, you're not professionals. I can't put, show you to a customer. I'm afraid that you're gonna hurt yourself. These are things that we can say, then we're gonna take disciplinary action on at that po point in time. This avoids some of the policy conundrums where it's, do we have to uh, accommodate Maria's going to the bachelorette party because she's being professional today and she hasn't had a day where she's been unprofessional. So it, if you use the unprofessional behavior and the conduct of the individual as your basis to take disciplinary action, it can be cleaner and easier than actually taking action because of a positive drug test. Now, I was talking to a friend a few days ago who is an executive director of an, a memory care center, so think nursing home, and she was talking to me about how she understands that employers want the test because it provides the proof, like you actually have proof. Well, if I have a positive test, then I absolutely know that the person was under the influence and it makes it easier. Well, that proof doesn't necessarily make it cleaner under all states because you still have the circumstances around it that could muddy the waters, but the professionalism and the misconduct are easier to say, and the employer's discretion has a lot of weight here if you were ever challenged on that going forward. So I would like you guys all to think a little bit about if we're going to test, 
do we test for marijuana? And if we test for marijuana, is there alternatives to actually having to send somebody for a test for the marijuana? Um, and I'm going to urge you that there are. The professionalism is something that you can absolutely use. Okay. So I think we have a few minutes left for questions. Do we have any more, Ryan? We do. So awesome. let's use this time. If you have questions, drop them in the Q&A box and we will get them into Q. We do have a handful here. Awesome. Uh, so let's see how much time do we have left. So let's take a look. All right, okay. so we've got about 10 minutes or so. Yep. Uh, we'll just keep that in mind. We've got, we'll probably one, two, three, four. We'll probably take 10 or 12. Awesome. If we keep them to a minute real quick, we can do that. Uh, so where is the best place to view the laws for each state? So there are a bunch of different resources out there for marijuana currently. Um, one place that I go to, which is really nerdy, so don't think I'm super crazy, but the National Council for State Legislatures has a good tracker of marijuana laws by state. And so it's NC ncsl.org, I believe is the website. And you can type in marijuana and it will show you the status of some bills. Um, for example, legalizing marijuana has been introduced in a lot of different states, even though they might still be illegal states for purposes of our analysis because it had the bills haven't actually been passed through. But um, NCSL has a Ha is a good depository to start if you want to look at more information about the various state laws. Okay, and we'll we'll gather some of these resources together and include them in the uh, follow up email out after the webinar. Okay, there are different variations of marijuana, THC, CBD, etc. Does the mm -hmm. testing target the type? If so, should policy reflect a breakdown of the marijuana type? I don't know if the drug testing goes out by type. That's a very interesting question. Um, I do know that when you're when you're hiring a testing vendor, you can decide if you're going to do a five panel or a ten panel. I believe a lot of vendors have changed that to be you now can have a four panel, a five panel, a nine panel, a ten panel, and they're discounting marijuana off of that of those options. And so I do know that there are ways that you could still do drug testing for cocaine and heroin and all the other really bad stuff um, and not include marijuana in that or do the five panel and separate out THC and the other marijuana pieces so that you can make decisions based on that. Um, so that's generally if a client is going to be doing testing, I recommend is that we we want to make sure that marijuana has its own categorization because it does provide some more thinking for us in states where it is medical marijuana appropriate. So I I don't know the actual answer to your question. I'm sorry that I don't. Um, but ask your vendor for that information if you're going to consider doing testing. Cool. All right, this one is, I work for a national residential property management company that has a blanket, no marijuana policy that is creating a huge problem with recruiting mm -hmm. maintenance staff. What are your thoughts on states that are legal and are entering residential apartments? So you've got a couple of tricky situations in there, right? Because you might not see your maintenance guys for or gals for long periods of time um, because they might even be residing in the facilities that you have. Um, and so you have to think about, well, if they're not here, if I don't see them, does that impact whether or not we should have testing? Uh, you most certainly are going to have a recruiting issue because uh, if we think of maintenance if you think of the stereotypes, which I generally try to stay away from, um, you might have this recruiting issue here. So what I would consider is how do we want to present ourselves to our customers or to our residents? And do we think it will be OK to say to employees, we are still going to demand very high standards from you professionally? And if we see or suspect that you're not being professional or that you're being disrespectful, that you're not responding to resident co concerns quickly enough, we will take action at that point. However, we're going to, we may stop testing for this or change our analysis on it. Um, you don't have to have black and white policies here. You could still do the testing for marijuana, but then have those conversations with individuals about 
when did you do it? How did you do it? Uh, can we make sure that you're only doing it during off work time and not anywhere near one of our facilities? You might want to have those kinds of conversations about what you do because it's going to be important that you still maintain your professionalism and your branding to your residents in a, such a way that can still reflect how you want to be presented. But you'll have to go through that analysis of, you know, we're, we're not getting people and we're not being able to keep people. And if we tell them, we if we test and it shows up and you can prove to us that you did it not on work time, well, then we might have a different tack. You might not want to advertise that, but you might want to, when you do get that positive test, you might want to consider having those conversations with people. Okay. When thinking about state specific policies, do we follow the state the employee lives in or works in, assuming these are not the same state and there are different rules in each location? Yes. So I live in a border town. Well, not technically a border town, but a lot of people commute from Wisconsin to Minnesota. Wisconsin is an unlawful state. Minnesota is a medical state. We would have different ways of handling it. Typically, the rule has been you follow the rule where the employer is and where the employee works, not necessarily where they live. And so if you're in that position where you're in that border place and people come and go, um, or if you have people who work remotely in a state where it's lawful, you're going to have to kind of consider what it would be the best for your organization. Usually the choice of law and the choice of forum falls to where the employer is and you're able to create the rules and regulations based upon your location. Um, it's been tried to say that I live in this state and so these laws should apply, but it's very rare that that actually comes out that way. Um, but I wouldn't want to be the employer who had to go to court to test that theory. So I think you're going to be safer. Your risk might be a little lower, but you want to focus on where you're at, if that makes sense. Okay. Here's another one. How is asking if it is for a medical condition not violating HIPAA? Well, first of all, employers who are not healthcare providers are not regulated by HIPAA. You may be regulated under the Americans with Disabilities Act in your state law that has that, but you should know if you do not provide healthcare, you are not HIPAA regulated. Usually I, there's a yay at this point in my presentation when I say things like that. That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you are concerned about asking, hey, we t you tested positive for marijuana, do you have a prescription for it as the justification? So for example, if somebody came in and tested positive for an opioid, but they had a prescription for oxycodone because they're in a great deal of pain, well, we would do the same kind of analysis in that situation. If when they're going in for the testing, we ask that question, are you on anything that could affect the results of this test? It's okay to ask that question when you have that specific purpose of asking it. And we're not asking, hey, what's your medical condition? That's where the line is going to be drawn. You tested positive for marijuana. Do you have a prescription for it? Is why is this test testing positive? It's not asking for the medical information that might be prohibited under the ADA. Okay, let me, I'm going to read this out. I, I don't know if I follow it, but in a fully legalized country, Canada, okay. would, we be able, would we be able to tell employees when not to use marijuana? Okay, I got that. For example, okay. during their break and off of company property. We have a couple other questions like that. Let me read one okay. here. Um, can I smoke in the designated smoking areas for cigarette smokers? So both of those kind of go together. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna be real cautious here and say I would not recommend you toke up in the designated smoking spots. Just gonna say that that might be something where you it could really affect the workplace and it not only hurt your reputation but also your employer's reputation because if you are getting high at work that is very different than smoking a cigarette yeah i realize that cigarettes do have an immediate effect um and really can behave a little bit like caffeine or makes people a little bit mellowed out 
but getting high is different. I still would not recommend you do it in a work setting, at work, or with your buddies from work at happy hour, okay? I still would not recommend it. That said, if you have employees in Canada who may, or even in a state where it is lawful, you can still prohibit employees from doing it at work. Um, you, what you cannot do is say, or what I would not recommend you do is say, you can never do it ever, 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 because that's going to really limit you both in, and potentially hurt you in retention and in recruiting. So that's generally what I recommend, but you can say, we, we won't tolerate being high at work. This is not, I mean, even if you are a landscaping company and you wanna make stone jokes all day long, I still would not get stoned at work, so. Right. All right, so we have uh, so we, we have some questions around repeating the national site mentioned. That was the National Council for State, State Legislatures. Legislatures. Yep. yep. NCSL.org. Is that right? I believe so. Okay. So the site is National Council for State Legislators. If you need to jot that down, and we'll include that in, in our follow-up. Uh, all right, we have time for let's do one more question. Okay. Uh, so this is from a small business owner here. As a small business owner, should we consider rewriting or revising our policy from no tolerance to allowing people to do what they want in terms of attracting creative talent? And then in parentheses, creative talent, meaning designers. You know, you might want to consider it. Um, it I am convinced that in more and more individuals are going to be testing the waters with marijuana, and that is going to be something that we're going to see more frequently. And if you limit yourself to a smaller pool of individuals from which to hire from, and you take a zero tolerance stance, meaning that I'm never going to hire anyone who ever tests positive for marijuana, you're going to be missing out on the Maria's of the world from the example earlier. And so I would take the tact of not necessarily saying we're going to openly tolerate, go smoke all you want, eight, it's, you know, we're looking for Willie Nelsons here and only Willie Nelsons. Um, you don't have to go that far. What you can say is we're going to be responsible when we're at work and or when we're doing the work and so you could say to folks we don't want you to be unprofessional and we believe that being high is unprofessional and so we're going to hold you to that standard if you're not high and you're at work awesome if you're high at work no tolerance so you might want to make that kind of consideration and particularly for that kind of population, if the stereotypes hold true, so. Okay, well, that brings us to the top of the hour and the end of today. Kate, thank you so much for jumping thank on. Thank you. Having a lot of great information. Um, so for everyone that was on the call or everyone that's still on the call, we will send the recording. We will have an email coming out shortly. You'll get some good resources in there. You'll get the deck. You'll get a link out to the recording as well. Uh, and if you have any questions for Kate, I know there were some very specific questions we couldn't get to. Uh, seems like you might benefit from a one-to-one -one with Kate or a conversation, an email or something like that. Uh, I definitely can't answer those for you, but Kate <laughs> So uh, if you want to uh, just respond back to the email that we send out, we'll be able to connect you. We'll put, if you want us to put your contact info, we can put that in there. Uh, for Kate, feel free to reach out directly to her. Uh, and that's it. So thank you all for coming. Kate, thank you very much. Thank and we'll you. see everybody uh, next time. Have a good day.